Maria Del Pino, um, Monica, um, all of you for coming, the university for inviting me. Um, uh, it's a tremendous honor and pleasure. I can't remember when I've spoken to such a large um, and, and eminent uh, audience. I've, I've visited Spain um, several times in the past, but, but uh, this is my first trip uh, uh, to Madrid and, and later to uh, Pamplona. And my wife and I very much look forward to a week of enjoying your country and only regret that we can't stay longer. Um, as uh, many of you know, my assignment is to talk to you about investigative journalism as a public service. And Carlos laid the groundwork very well for why investigative journalism as a public service is necessary now when it wasn't 10 years ago. Um, this is what I've devoted the last eight years of my um, uh, long professional life to. I believe passionately in its importance, and um, I suspect many of you do too. Nonprofit investigative reporting is one of the significantly growing parts in the dramatic reshaping that the business and profession of news has been undergoing in the last decade. Gone is the happy 40-year period from the mid-1960s to the start of the current century, essentially paralleling my entire first career in print journalism, in which the business was incredibly stable and profitable and the profession was increasingly rewarding. A decade or so ago, we embarked on an altogether different voyage in which the only constant in the news business is change. Um, the signs are growing, moreover, that in 2016, this year, the pace of change will accelerate on many fronts. If present trends in the uh, world economy continue, we could see multiple closings of print editions on uh, several days of the week in the US, in the US and in, in some cases entirely. There will inevitably be further movement of readers, of readers and advertisers to the web. Um, uh, in itself, more a positive than not, but with further financial pressures on legacy media, even those like my old paper, The Wall Street Journal, that have avidly pursued the internet. What I'd like to do uh, this evening is to lay out the current news landscape as I see it, identify the principal types of actors engaged in it, and describe where I think public service investigative journalism fits in the ecosystem developing on this landscape. I will try to show how useful and even important this kind of journalism is for the future, certainly in my own country, and I believe increasingly so in Europe and elsewhere. I will point to forces and trends that threaten all serious journalism, traditional or digital, for-profit or not, that all of us who care about the ability pe of people everywhere to speak and hear freely must stand against. And then, as Carlos indicated, I would be, lighted, be delighted to respond to questions and challenges from this illustrious audience. First, the landscape, which I'll uh, uh, try to sketch quickly in impressionistic strokes that I'd be happy to expand on if you direct me to do so with your questions and comments. Print newspapers are inexorably, relentlessly shrinking, hollowing out, and I'm afraid to say, ultimately dying, more rapidly in my country than in Europe, but I think relentlessly and ultimately here too. Why? It's a combination of the irresistible attractions of digital technology and the inevitable increase in cost per delivered copy of print. The most important effects on journalism of the Internet's rise flow from the fact that it has eliminated, the Internet's rise has eliminated barriers to entry by potential competitors. From the 1960s um, uh, to the early years of this century, if you wanted to get into the news business, you needed to invest many millions, often tens of millions, even a hundred million dollars, to acquire either printing presses or TV broadcast platforms. Today, all one needs is a laptop and a connection to the web, and presto, one is a publisher. Millions of people have taken advantage of that, 
Some have raised many millions of dollars in capital to do it in a big way, like, um, raise your hand if you've heard these names. BuzzFeed, has anybody heard the name BuzzFeed? Yes, a lot. Um, uh, Huffington Post, yes. Um, Vice, not Sin, but Vice, the, <laughs> the, uh, the website. Business Insider, probably not so many. Oh, some of you have, um, and, and others. Then there are folks like my wife, um, Wendy Brandis. Wendy, stand up, turn around so people can see you. Um, uh, Wendy is an award-winning uh, designer of jewelry, but she's also a brilliant writer. So uh, she started a blog eight years ago, um, and just like I was describing, she, got, she, she already had a laptop, she just got some software, and bingo, she was a publisher. Um, uh, she writes almost every day, uh, sometimes explicitly promoting her jewelry and other times more subtly, um, <laughs> but many times reporting or commenting irreverently about popular culture, history, gender, fashion, business, politics, celebrity, whatever strikes her fancy. With their laptop and software, she and others like her compete with much larger news organizations way larger news organizations, for readers' eyeballs. Others also compete for advertising. In the jargon of the industry, you, are, uh, you create content and produce inventory. Um, one result is to vastly broaden the range of ideas, insights, and potential knowledge offered on the web. And that is good. I, I just remembered, Wendy once wrote an essay about Juana La Loca. How many know, no, raise your hand, how many know Juana La Loca? Um, uh, um, you should read Wendy's um, essay. It will give you a whole new perspective on, um, on, on uh, the, the, uh, the history. Um, uh, so one result of this is to vastly broaden the range of ideas, insights, and potential knowledge offered on the web. And that's good. The other, as Carlos noted, is to drive down what publishers can charge uh, advertisers and thus to reduce their ability to fund investigative or watchdog or accountability reporting. That is not good. It's difficult to precisely quantify this migration to the internet by consumers for news, entertainment, commerce, and communication, and the parallel dizzying movement in the way we consume this stuff. Just Think about it. In a very short time, really less than 10 years, the technology has led us from desktop to laptop and, and tablet to smartphone and then back to big screens. We now watch internet linked television sets on the wall at home that are far bigger than any passive television set I um, uh, ever had before, while at the same time, we're getting up-to-the-minute news and instant highlights of sports events from um, uh, multiple sources on our phones. Some analysts purport to see um, a halt or at least a, a pause in um, the movement of consumers away from print and to digital without offering much evidence for that. They argue that by now, those who are going to switch have largely done so. Um, I just don't believe that, and, and neither do a lot of people who are a lot smarter than I am. Clay Shirky, one of the smartest uh, academic uh, observers of the news business in the U.S., says that such transitions follow a typically fast, slow, fast pattern, that right now we're in the middle, the temporary slow phase, you know, like the eye of the hurricane, and, um, uh, but then the movement will inevitably pick up tempo. My own colleague, uh, Dick Toffel, um, uh, and, and um, if Dick were here, he would be deeply offended. He has succeeded me as president of, of uh, ProPublica, but he's a good friend, so he'll forgive us. Um, um, uh, but Dick recently compiled data on the combined newsstand and subscription sales of the 25 largest print circulation dailies in the United States as of last September, which is the last time such data were made available. The numbers are embarrassingly small. Um, 
only one newspaper sold more than a million print copies on an average weekday, and that's my old paper, the Wall Street Journal, and only one more um, sold more than 500,000, um, uh, the one formally edited by your speaker last year, Jill Abramson, my friend, of, of the New York Times. The median for the group was 164,000 copies. I mean, that would be five or 10 years ago, that would be a you know, small metro um, uh, newspaper. Many of these newsrooms, of course, are devoting major energy to their web editions and their social media efforts. So you know, they're not just sitting there and let this trend hammer them, but that's the point. That is where they, they see their futures on the internet. And for now, because of all that content, all that inventory um, on the web, the ability for them to charge a healthy price to advertisers keeps going down. Some are able to charge readers for their web editions. Um, uh, the Wall Street Journal does, the New York Times does, the LA Times does to some extent, the Washington Post um, uh, does to, to a significant extent. But they're gaining revenue far below what they used to get from advertising. We're also starting to see the next turn of the screw on the print side. One of the great marvels of the happy years in the latter part of the 20th century was the application of cutting edge digital technology to 19th century industrial age printing and, um, and distribution. By aggressive marketing and pricing, newspapers were able to expand their circulations and thereby continually drive down the cost per copy. If you were putting 200 copies um, in uh, 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 a truck instead of 100 copies in the truck, and the truck is making the same trip, the cost goes way down for delivering uh, each of those papers. But now, that once happy spiral is being reversed. So you're selling fewer newspapers. There are fewer papers in the truck, but you still have to pay the driver. You still have to put gasoline in the truck. So as circulation falls, the cost to deliver each paper rises. The combination of these factors means that legacy news organizations are continually under a cost squeeze. They continue to shrink staffing, particularly of high-cost investigative reporters and foreign correspondents. But while they may help the struggling bottom line for a while, it weakens the product they deliver every day and adds to consumer diffidence toward that product. There is an another cost to this. Um, to the extent that less investigative reporting is done, society suffers. Corruption unreported is corruption unchecked. That is where outfits like ProPublica can make a positive contribution. We don't need to make, as, as Carlos said, we don't need to make a profit to repay investors. All we need to do is cover our costs. Investigative reporting is one of a broad category of services that economists call a public good. Public goods provide value to people whether or not the people choose to pay for them. Examples are fire and police protection, free public schools or hospitals, animal rescue services, and the like. Many people benefit from having them, but paying for them occurs principally in two ways, either by donations by public-spirited citizens, which is the way we at ProPublica get paid, or by the compulsion of taxes and government spending, which is how um, organizations like uh, uh, the BBC in, in the UK get paid, for example. To see how that works in practice, uh, consider this example. Like the first year we were um, operating, or the first year and a half we were operating, ProPublica reporters were able to prove that the agency which licenses nurses in the state of California was taking as long as six years, six years, to take away the license of nurses who had beaten up their patients, stolen their drugs. So you had literally dead patients as a result, or permanently disabled patients as a result. 
The nurses were fired when they got caught. Um, but what would they do? They would simply drive to another hospital, flash their licenses, and um, uh, the whole process would start over again. Our article describing this was published in partnership with the Los Angeles Times, the largest newspaper in the state. The next day, the state's governor fired the board and um, replaced them with members whom he mandated to fix the problem. The story thus benefited not just those who read it, not just those who bought the newspaper, but anyone who made use of a hospital in, in California. That's the way a public good works. Another example, just a few months ago, a large retailer of televisions, microwaves, and other home appliances uh, in the US closed. The action came after a ProPublica investigation published in collaboration with the Washington Post um, uh, that exposed that it was luring the families of American military personnel all at bases all around the country into taking out loans to buy grossly overpriced products, often double or triple the prices elsewhere, with the attraction of supposedly easy credit. Far from being easy, the company's credit contracts were a devil's hand on the throats of its customers. Uh, company salesmen uh, drew the customers into ever larger loan balances, and then when the balances grew lo too large to pay off, the loan contracts made it convenient for the company to go into court and sue buyers who paid late and then to seize their paychecks or bank accounts by order of uh, friendly nearby courts in Virginia where the company was headquartered, often hundreds, even thousands of miles away from the customer who, who had no way to defend himself. Citing our reporting, the Army and various government agencies set up rules forbidding these corrupt practices and the company went out of business. Another recent example, a recent example, this time not involving ProPublic except in a small indirect way. Not all of you may know it, but BuzzFeed, um, the for-profit news startup that has grown to global scale from its listicle and cat video beginnings, nothing wrong with cat videos, I love <laughs> cats, um, uh, created, BuzzFeed created a team to do investigative reporting a couple of years ago. Its latest major effort was a collaboration with the BBC in Britain, mustering evidence that there may have been fixing of tennis matches to benefit certain gamblers. There's a lot of gambling on tennis. It's not just um, uh, what you call football, what I call soccer, um, uh, but a lot of people bet on tennis. And just this week, um, uh, as the Australian Open, uh, Open was starting, a major sports gaming operation shut down betting on a match where there were signs of suspicious betting activity. The small indirect tie to ProPublica, <clears throat> Mark Schuf's, the brilliant editor who heads the BuzzFeed investigative team, was, uh, shall we say, recruited or stolen from us by uh, BuzzFeed uh, um, uh, a couple of years ago. The tennis example points up some of the incipient trends in, in investigative reporting. One is collaboration. Nonprofit news organizations are more inclined to collaborate because they don't need to protect knowledge that is owned by for-profit stockholders. Often, two heads are better than one. You, uh, you can combine audiences. You can uh, combine sources, combine, combine um, uh, re uh, reporting and editing skills, and so on. The BBC is nonprofit in the sense that it doesn't need to satisfy shareholders, but it's a government agency funded by money from government-imposed fees. Um, in the US, public radio and television are an increasing source of investigative reporting, and um, we love partnering with them. The United States is unusually well-suited to support nonprofit news organizations. There are substantial tax donations for donors, and there's a long established tradition of charitable giving for an enormous range of causes. But such efforts um, needn't be and increasingly aren't limited to North America. After some initial uh, stumbling, a not-for-profit not reporting organization, the Bureau of Investigative Reporting, is gaining significant momentum in Britain, 
journalists in Italy, France, Germany, and Spain have talked to me about the possibility of such efforts in uh, their countries. As these examples suggest, nonprofit investigative reporting has a role to play in filling the gap left by the shrinkage of legacy media in recent years. There are now more than 100 members of the Global Investigative Reporting Network, um, many of them nonprofits. While some fail, others are succeeding. Meantime, as the BuzzFeed example suggests, some media startups are testing the results for them of doing some kind of this reporting. Combined with uh, investigative work by public broadcasters, reporting platforms at journalism schools and some law schools and other university settings, crowdsourcing projects, um, and other such efforts, progress is being made, but there needs to be much more. Before seeking your questions and comments, I want to raise one more issue with this audience. It concerns what to me is a disturbing set of trends that are making many kinds of reporting, but especially investigative reporting, increasingly difficult for reporters and editors. I'm talking about a set of uh, intimidating techniques that can weigh heavily on reporters and their families as they seek to um, ferret out and communicate the truth. One is criminal defamation. Now that's a big Latinate phrase, um, but what it means that, is that in some countries, subjects of investigative reporting can go into court and obtain jail sentences against the journalists involved. Now, we in journalism should be subject to civil penalties, to fines um, uh, or civil damages if we're proven to publish falsehoods that damage people um, because we did so deliberately or negligently or recklessly, but not jail time. It is uh, typically government prosecutors and courts who decide who goes to jail and it is often governments that are the subject of watchdog reporting. The, the targets of the stories shouldn't have this powerful a weapon uh, in their hands. Um, in the past, thanks to efforts by the Committee to Protect Journalists and other such organizations, mm -hmm. the, use, the use of this kind of blunderbuss was being restrained. But now the procedure is reemerging in parts of Europe and Latin America among other places. Another threat against journalists merely doing their jobs is the rise of anti-blasphemy laws in some countries. Now, I grew up understanding that blasphemy is a sin, okay? How many of you have seen um, the movie Spotlight? A couple of people. I, I don't think it's, it's come to uh, Europe yet. I think it's been mostly in, in uh, North America so far. Um, how many have heard of it? haven't seen it. Yeah, so, some more. Um, uh, it is one of the eight nominees for Best Picture at this year's Academy Awards. Um, and it does one of the best jobs I've ever seen of a movie in showing what it's really like to conduct investigative um, reporting. Under some forms of anti-blasphemy laws, the filmmakers could be prosecuted and so could the journalists who were the subject of the film. Why? Because the film portrays how the Boston Globe newspaper, through its so-called spotlight team of reporters and editors, that's where the title comes from, exposed the huge cover-up by the Roman Catholic um, Archdiocese of, of um, uh, Boston and its collaborators of pedophilia by more than 100 uh, priests in Boston and surrounding uh, areas of Massachusetts. No large and powerful institution, governmental, financial, industrial, or religious, should be exempt from criticism. If the criticism is false and reckless, the critics should answer in court under the laws of libel and slander. But they shouldn't be barred from making the criticism in the first place or put in jail, whether the religion's home is Rome, Moscow, Mecca, Athens, India, Salt Lake City, or wherever. On September 11, 2001, my office was diagonally across New York's West Side Highway from the World Trade Center. Luckily, no Wall Street Journal people died as a result of the terrorist attacks that day. But we all lost friends, 
just as some of you lost friends or friends of friends in the Madrid train bombing or in Paris or San Bernardino or Oklahoma City. So we can all be forgiven for wanting increased protection from acts of terror. But does that mean that government investigators should be given carte blanche to monitor and root around in citizens' phone and computer records or reporters' phone and computer records? I think the answer is no. Some such access is appropriate and necessary. I will grant that. But the line should be carefully drawn, and I think more carefully than it's been drawn in the past. Finally, the murder or execution of journalists simply for doing their jobs should be branded what it is, a crime against humanity. Perpetrators caught and convicted should receive the severest punishment allowed in the prosecuting jurisdiction. It is one thing for journalists or any other civilian to die in the inevitable crossfires of war. It's another for them to be targeted by bloodthirsty war criminals who often videotape the executions in a kind of pornography of violence. Ladies and gentlemen, I, I thank you for your attention. Um, if there is one thought I'd like to leave you with tonight, it is this. There is supposedly an ancient Chinese curse that says, may you live in interesting times. Well, we live in interesting times. Um, but I don't regard that as a curse. As journalists, we have inherited instincts and skills that have helped set human beings apart for millennia. We wear the ancient mantle of the storyteller who brought to the campfires the knowledge assembled um, by themselves and their predecessors of um, what made heroes great and their enemies vanquishable, of what safeguarded the herds and the harvests and what put them at risk, of what brought health and fertility and what led to disease and death. The passion to tell, tell stories and to listen to them is hardwired into the human psyche. It's genetic. So there will always be a role for us. Now we are in a time of turmoil and disruption brought on by the emergence of powerful new tools. Those of us who see this as an opportunity will succeed. Those who cringe in terror will not. Thank you very much, and I'd be delighted to respond to your questions and comments. Okay, I've got many questions, uh, interesting, and, uh, uh, but I want to start with a very crispy question. <laughs> Recently, actor Sean Penn uh, tried to make an interview to El Chapo, famous drug dealer, and capo, Mexican capo, and he acted as a journalist. And the person that is... Uh, uh, has written this question is, what is your opinion about that? That an actor that is not a journalist uh, acted as a journalist? Well, in the United States, um, we don't allow tests for deciding who is a journalist. If, um, when I was uh, chairman of the Committee to Protect Journalists, we would aid journalists, and the question was, who is a journalist? And the answer is anyone who's doing journalism. Um, uh, so I'm perfectly willing. I, I love Sean Penn as an actor. <laughs> I'm not quite so respecting of his journalistic skills, but at least he's behaving as, as um, a journalist. And he, he also visited um, uh, your friend Hugo Chavez um, <laughs> in, in, uh, in, in uh, uh, Venezuela. And... Um, uh, you know, it's, um, and Rolling Stone, who published his report, um, they had the great advantage of, first of all, access to a famous, in some quarters, folk hero, drug dealer, in other quarters, a murderer, <laughs> um, uh, and the star power of Sean Penn combined. So, you know, it was a great uh, circulation driver. Um, 
And uh, the, um, uh, there are reports as yet not publicly sourced that um, uh, Penn's interview may have, uh, which, which Sean Penn vigorously denies, um, that his interview may have uh, helped um, the, uh, the investigators track him down and, and uh, capture, capture him. Others say it was the visit by the actress that, that, uh, um, uh, that did that. So Sean Penn can do what he wants. Um, I'm not sure I would hire him to do that the way, um, uh, the way Rolling Stone did. But, you know, different places have, um, have um, different principles, and it's, um, uh, it's fine. I, I've got no objection to it. Okay, this is a question. Uh, I think it comes from a journalist, because people is interested in knowing how much do you pay to your investigators <laughs> in ProPublica. <laughs> You can make the comparisons now, <laughs> guys. I, I, I've been here for um, uh, two days and have, have met with various groups of journalists, and that question um, has been asked in almost uh, um, every case. And, and when we started out setting up the basic model of ProPublica, one of the things we said was we wanted to pay market rates for journalists. There were a lot of journalists being laid off or um, um, being um, uh, forcibly retired, um, uh, you know, looking for jobs and being being prepared to take lower pay. And in some cases, we did recruit some of those folks because we knew they were excellent. But we wanted to get people who had jobs. We wanted um, the best journalists to come to um, ProPublica, and that meant. To attract them, we would have to pay market rates, mm -hmm. and so that's what we did. So to hire a um, star financial reporter in the middle of the uh, 2008 financial mess, one um, uh, came on the market who was really terrific, and um, but he was uh, he had lots of bidders, um, including you know big, respectable news organizations who were offering him more than we could possibly before, afford. But we got as close to their number, which was over $200,000, and um, we offered him that, and he took it, even though it was less than his um, uh, best offer. And um, I don't know, do football players take less than the best offer? I'm not sure, but, but in any case, he took less than the, the financially uh, best offer, and, um, and it's worked out very well for him. On the other hand, um, when we hire younger reporters, and I think it's important to have young as well as experienced reporters in the newsrooms, so you have a diversity of sources and interests, um, uh, but we would find many of them working at, at uh, startups or in, um, uh, smaller newsrooms for like $30,000 a year, $35,000 a year. They were delighted when we paid them $50,000 a year, and we weren't going to pay them more. We're not going to waste our donors' money. Um, if, you know, if, if your, your price is $50,000, bingo, you know, that's what we hire you for. So, um, But are you talking about pr practitioners, very, very young journalists? Yeah. Just, oh, we, we won't mention the figures in Spain are really yeah, yeah, ridiculous. But, but look, this is New York. Yeah. The cost of living is a little bit higher in New York than it is in Madrid, uh, in Madrid I think. Yeah. Um, what are the prices I've seen since I've, since I've um, been here. And also, we're bidding them away from their current jobs. Yeah. You know? so, um, uh, so yeah, we, we, we respond to the market. Uh, there is an interesting question. Are the big American media giving up investigations to subcontractors? Um, the answer is no. Um, uh, we um, collaborate with um, most of the biggest 
everyone, ironically, except for the Wall Street Journal. Um, uh, and um, uh, and our, our two biggest um, collaborators are the New York Times and the Washington Post. And um, um, with uh, the, the Washington Post, we have, um, I don't know, maybe a dozen stories a year. Um, with the New York Times, it's more, um, it's been more in the past because one of our, our reporters was giving a, um, uh, was producing a column that they were using um, along with us, but he's um, uh, taking a leave to write a book and when he comes back, they're not going to continue, uh, he and they are not going to continue that column. So with the New York Times, it's essentially the same. It's a, you know, maybe a dozen, 15 stories a year. That, just does not make a significant difference mm -hmm. to the um, uh, the finances of of um, uh, of the New York Times. People is interested in, in knowing how do you cooperate with uh, New York Times and BBC and so on in a daily basis. It's easy to have uh, meetings and to plan and to discuss issues, reports. Um, first of all, what, what most of the collaboration is on projects and um, so typically with them we'll say that you know we've had this project going um, uh, and um, uh, it looks like it's hitting pay dirt it looks like it's uh, succeeding there's a story there <clears throat> and here's what the story is likely to say are you interested and they'll either say yes or no and you know that's one conversation and then as the story gets close to completion, we'll share with them drafts. We offer to um, uh, let their editors uh, interview our reporters, um, their lawyers interview our reporters. They can ask who our sources are. We ask them not to, their editors not to tell their reporters who the sources are because we don't want their reporters going and screaming at a, you know, the source they thought they had. Um, um, because that will prevent us from getting the next story, and, and um, people people have agreed to that. And then it's it's a process that you know we ha we have to decide what's the best time to publish the story. Um, uh, they may suggest some changes, and we can agree or disagree. Um, they have the right not to publish the story. We have the way to the right to pull it back, but. Um, uh, in the end, I don't think we've ever pulled a story back. Um, uh, and most of the time, once we get that far down the road, the story ends up getting published. Okay. I, some journalists believe that big investigations come usually in anonymous envelopes that the girl in the reception received with a boring gesture of oh, another investigation and they pass to the journalist. Do you <laughs> agree? Do you receive many anonymous envelopes? Most of the anonymous envelopes we um, receive have return addresses in jail cells. <laughs> and um, uh, and they, um, you know, they, they start writing across the page and then they write along the side and, and they talk about um, uh, you know, people messing with their brains and, you know, with, with microwaves and all of that stuff. <laughs> but we always empty, open those em envelopes um, because um, sometimes there's pay there in there. Um, more often, the stories come from um, uh, data analysis. Um, uh, uh, sometimes we have to sue to get the data. Other times it's, it's given... Um, it's given to us from talking to knowledgeable people, um, uh, um, from um, putting two and two together and hypothesizing that there's a story. I, I mean, you know, you know this better than I do. I mean, it's that the process that that uh, goes forward um, uh, for um, uh, for finding a story. And then this, the idea is refined. We have to decide, editors in combination with reporters, whether this story is worth spending 
first a few weeks on, then a few months on to you know to uh, uh, to bring it to um, uh, uh, fruition. This is a very interesting question: is which are realistic and sustainable business models for online investigative reporting in non-democratic countries and non-free market countries? Because they need investigations. Um, does such a thing exist? <laughs> um, uh, uh, you, you know, I mean, that's um, that's like saying, um, uh, where does something, uh, where does a technology exist that would allow me to fulfill my dream of being a successful major league baseball pitcher? I mean, it's. Um, um, uh, first of all, in non-democratic countries, investigative reporting by people within the country is not allowed. So if you're going to do investigative reporting, you've, um, uh, y you often have to infiltrate um, uh, the country and develop sources. Uh, um, uh, sometimes, um, I mean, this has happened in Eastern Europe, people can um, uh, embark on um, uh, investigative journalism projects and they're not noticed by the authorities and they can get away with it for a while but they're usually funded from uh, from overseas mm -hmm. um, uh, so I don't um, uh, I can't think of a model that that would be sustainable D did the questioner say for profit yep uh, it's, no, no. The question is uh, if it's sustainable, sustainable, but it's profitable. Is it su sustainable. Look, George Soros, if he decides to fund it, yep. he can do it, and it'll be sustainable as long as he funds it. But um, uh, or until the authorities find out and shut it down, which and it, that's likely to happen first. Mm -hmm. Oh, uh, who's going to investigate abuses in the media? But practice in newspapers. Do you do it? Um, uh, we have not, so far, that I can remember, launched a full bore um, mm -hmm. investigation of um, uh, uh, media. But we are we are open to it, and um, we do have um, a column, a commentary column written by um, um, my successor as editor-in-chief, Steve Engelberg, called A Second Look. And what it is is a look at journalism, sometimes our own, sometimes other people's, where we criticize it. Uh, so we're, we're open to doing that, and we are certainly open to embarking on a big investigation if we find um, uh, leads to uh, corruption by media. So far, we haven't found such a lead, but if any of you have it, bring it on. <laughs> what was the news that cost you the most in terms of suffering, personal, emotionally? Oh, I mean, th 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 without question, it was um, uh, the, the murder of um, my um, colleague, a young reporter, uh, Danny Pearl in 2002 um, by militants who seized him in Pakistan and um, was one of the first of these um, we're going to put cutting off your head on a, on a video and use it as a rec recruiting tool. It was, um, it was agony when we discovered he had been taken. Um, we enlisted um, uh, the, the, his kidnappers um, wrapped themselves in um, uh, Islamic, um, you know, words and phrases. So we we reached out to um, uh, Islamic uh, leaders um, uh, who would say, you know, this is this is a reporter who has never done anything against mm -hmm. uh, Islam, um, to no avail. The the same person who planned the um, uh, World Trade Center um, uh, attacks is the one who executed him. I remember. 
So that really was the, the, by far the most agonizing mm -hmm. story we ever um, had to do. Um, how we can embrace new technologies in order to strengthen quality journalism? I'm sorry? That how can we uh, um, embrace new technologies in order to improve the journalism, quality journalism? I, look, I, I mean, I think it is, um, it's a major part of um, our program at ProPublica. There are, there are things that we can do with data analysis and creating databases now that I couldn't have dreamed of doing um, just eight years ago when I was at um, uh, the Wall Street Journal. Or the things that we did do would take 10 times as long to do them at the Wall Street Journal as we now can do with the new breed of reporter who is both an adept computer programmer and um, a journalist who thinks like um, uh, thinks about stories and um, and can even write. Um, th th this is um, uh, a a wonderful emergence um, that is that is very very new. Um, former com uh, computer science majors who s slipped over into um, uh, English or history or political science or um, uh, journalism because uh, they wanted to hang out with a girlfriend or boyfriend, maybe. I don't know what the motivation was, but they, they got both of the um, uh, skill sets, and, and it's, and it's, it's a, an enormous asset. Um, this summer, we released something that, that we called Surgeon's Scorecard, um, which is um, money we got from the Medicare and Medicaid government health systems. Uh, we, we, we had to threaten them with lawsuits to, uh, to get them, but millions of data points about the performance of individual surgeons all, all across the country. Any, anyone whose patients um, uh, were eligible for either of those programs, Medicare, which means you're in Social Security, or Medicaid, which means you're in, you're, um, in poverty. And as a result, um, you can now enter your um, a physician you're, you're using or thinking of using, enter it into an app, and it will give you a report on where that physician stands relative to peers um, uh, in terms of uh, complications, readmissions to the hospital. Is the, is, is the doctor uh, above average, average, below average? Mm -hmm. um, that um, is now available that, that you couldn't have dreamed of doing something like that just a few years ago. So the, the, there are, I could go on and on and on about the kinds of things we're able to use uh, digital technology for. Um, and, um, and getting the story out, you know, using social media. Um, uh, the, the rise of Twitter allowed us to n not have to um, partner with other news organizations to get a story before the public. We still like to partner because it enhances the audience, mm -hmm. but um, uh, with um, Twitter, we, we um, tweet the story and, um, it, it, you know, you double the audience, um, uh, you know, kind of just like, just like that. And now uh, we, we weren't doing so well on Facebook, now we are. Um, that's an, another great enhancement. So there all kinds of new tools that make us po make it possible for us to prove things that before we could only suggest um, uh, existed, and to find things that we would have no ways no way of knowing in the past. Al, um, you say that you defend civil rights in America, but this question is. What is your ideology? Are you pro-Republican or pro-Democrat? Um, Very typical uh, question. Yeah, look. Um, uh, most of the time for president, I voted for Democrats. Um, uh, I voted four times. Uh, twice for governor of California and twice for president against Ronald Reagan, 
who I now believe was the most successful U.S. president since FDR, so I'm not always uh, smart. Um, uh, and I voted for, I have voted for um, uh, Republicans in um, local elections, particularly when I lived in California. In, um, in New York City, um, uh, even on the Upper East Side where, where, where we live, you're choosing among Democrats. You're, there, there, there's not often a viable Republican um, to vote for, so I've mostly voted for Democrats mm -hmm. in, in New York. Are you thinking in launching ProPublica in Europe, in another country, in Spain, in Madrid, or the other side? Have you got offers from other countries to launch ProPublica? We've, we've had um, feelers, we've, we've, we've done conversations of not so much launching a ProPublica Europe or a um, um, ProPublica Russia, um, uh, that's a joke. Um, uh, <laughs> um, uh, 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 or, um, uh, uh, but, but other ways to um, uh, collaborate. I mean, um, uh, in my time, both at the Wall Street Journal and the LA Times, there were um, stories that that ar that arose involving U.S. aerospace companies. Um, bribing public officials in Japan. And I've talked to big newspapers um, in Japan, and I said, look, if you ever get wind of something like that again, we will, you know, go halvesies with you on that story. So far it hasn't, it hasn't happened, but that kind of story we would be open to immediately. We've also talked about when we think about where would be um, uh, potential expansion, we've thought about um, trying to see what we could do to, to offset the gap in foreign reporting that is parallel to the gap in investigative reporting in the U.S. Their number of reporters sent overseas by American news organizations is way, way, way down. Um, uh, but the, the, the one significant expansion we've had was to deepen our existing beat mm -hmm. structure, which has proved to be you know, the right decision. But we've looked at um, doing foreign reporting. We've also looked at doing, um, uh, you know, picking a state or two in the U.S. because there's a real concern about local investigative reporting and see if we could come up with a ProPublica model for local or state or regional mm -hmm. reporting. And we, th we think about that, but there's nothing, you know, serious mm -hmm. um, on the hopper right, uh, right now. Some people is uh, trying to ask you what is your opinion about Julian Assange that is in, uh, in the uh, Equatorian Embassy in London. And I want to extend the question to uh, Snowden that is in Russia. And these people have helped uh, journalists, investigative journalists, to keep rolling. What do you think about them? Well, you, you know, they're, they're, they're um, each, you know, they're very different personalities, and and um, and and so I have sort of different attitudes about their personalities. Um, um, I've I've met Julian. I've never met uh, Snowden. Um, um, but uh, you know, I I think that um, uh, th there was important stuff disclosed. Um, we learned important things as a society, both a U.S. society and a global society, from uh, uh, both sets of disclosures. Um, uh, um, the newspapers that, um, uh, that Assange um, collaborated with, newspapers and magazines, <clears throat> you know, the, the, the um, on the New York Times, Der Spiegel, The Guardian, top-notch organizations, and they made every effort to um, uh, try to protect um, uh, cases where um, people's lives might be in danger if their names weren't mm -hmm. uh, redacted, and I, I think they were more careful about it than, than Julian was inclined um, 
uh, to be. So, you know, there are, um, uh, there are some negatives, but mostly pluses. I think it is important that people got to debate um, what is the appropriate level of surveillance mm -hmm. that should, should go on of, of um, uh, American citizens, foreign citizens, the chancellor of Germany, you know, I mean, um, uh, that's, that was a, a, a topic that hadn't been um, debated in, in, in the U.S. And, and some of the issues um, was less so with, with Assange's disclosures, but, but some of those um, disclosures were, uh, uh, you know, had a similar moment. And so it, it was in the public interest uh, uh, to have them um, uh, to have them reported. It's a privilege to have donors that give you millions of dollars or thousands of, thousands of dollars. But uh, have you been influenced in some way uh, uh, by these donors? Have they tried to do that, to influence? Um, I you know, you could give me a lie detector test and I would pass it saying, you know, that um, we have never been influenced by a donor, and I honestly don't think we have. We have a, a rule that started from before we opened our doors, when we were just forming our launch funders, Herbert Marion Sandler, I said to them, to operate this the way we want to operate it, which is nonpartisan as well as nonprofit investigative journalism, the the decision on the journalism needs to stop stop with me, as the editor, uh, then the editor in chief, um, and they said absolutely we we agree a hundred percent. One of the first resolutions of the board um, was that um, members of the board and contributors could suggest stories, I would take the, um, uh, I would take a story idea from the devil herself if, um, uh, you know, it was a, if it proved out, you know. Um, uh, but um, uh, we, we also said that, that donors and members of the board could only um, offer story ideas to the two top editors because we felt it, you know, reporters would be intimidated. Herb Sandler himself, I don't know how many story ideas he has offered. How many do you think we've done? And it was a really good story, but all of his other ideas were either lousy or we didn't have the right staff to do them or, you know, but um, we have done one uh, story that he suggested. We have had a couple of donors get really angry at some stories we've done. Um, uh, we had a, a significant donor in California who's a passionate Democrat. And we did a story exposing how the Democratic Party um, rigged the, um, uh, the, the supposedly nonpartisan um, district drawing um, uh, effort that was launched with great fanfare in California and some other states. In some other states, we exposed Republicans. But in California, the biggest state, we got these documents showing the Democrats gloating on how they had rigged this. It infuriated him. And, um, and, you know, we didn't get his check. You know, we explained to him that, that um, you know, we call them as we see them. And um, uh, this was a very appropriate story for us to do. We're nonpartisan. And he humphed. Um, but a year later, he came back. So. I have two more questions. And the last one is about Donald Trump. So stay in your seats. <laughs> What's your opinion of Jeff Bezos? Jeff Bezos is the founder and owner of Amazon, and he bought uh, the prestigious Washington Post, not the company, he personally. What is your opinion about this dealing? I, 
I think it's absolutely terrific. Um, uh, the um, uh, the editor of the Washington Post, uh, Marty Barron, um, is one of the f figures in spotlight because he was editor of the Boston Globe at the time. He and I worked together at at um, the L.A. Times, and we've uh, been friends for you know for many many years. And um, he's a very strong editor, and he is. Um, you know, I'm confident that journalistic values are going to be upheld at the Washington Post. Secondly, Jeff um, Bezos is a very smart man. He will bring um, ideas for using digital technology um, uh, to um, uh, uh, that, that no one in the news business would think of um, and may have already. I, I, don't, um, I don't know. Um, uh, that, that no one in the news business would, would, um, would think of. Um, he's, I'm sure he didn't do this for charity. Um, uh, he's someone who, um, uh, is, um, uh, whose businesses, um, uh, you know, can run afoul of various uh, government agencies. And so having a platform in Washington is probably not mm -hmm. unattractive um, uh, um, to him. Um, but I think he also understands that um, uh, if he does something that crosses an ethical line, his own newspaper will react. Will react. Yeah. So, so um, uh, I've, um, I've, I've met Jeff. Um, uh, he he came to the journal a, a number of times when when I was editing the the journal and I've met him in, at social events and I th think he's a very smart guy and and glad to have him join the journalism fraternity. So Paul, are we going to see Donald Trump as president of superpower United States of America? You're going to see Donald Trump with his hand on the nuclear trigger. Um, you know, if you'd asked me this a couple of months ago, I would have said not a chance. Um, I still don't think it's, it's likely, um, but I'm not saying not a chance again. And, and um, I, Donald I know quite well. Um, uh, and um, he, used, he used to come um, uh, to the Wall Street Journal to have lunch with reporters and editors many times, and he used to complain about our coverage often. All the time. And um, um, he, um, and what you see is what you get. He's, he's, in a when he when he visits, he's exactly like he is on television. He shoots from the lip. He says, whatever's the first thing that pops into his um, head, and that, but then he stays with it. Um, <laughs> He's a he's a he's a born showman, and um, uh, he, you know there's a lot of stuff that is very complicated about being the president of the United States, and um, you can either you know immerse yourself in it and and be um, um, be smart enough to assimilate a large part of it and, and have that kind of character that likes to assimilate um, lots of, of stuff. Uh, Bill, Bill Clinton, when he wasn't doing other nefarious things um, uh, with interns, um, uh, you know, that kind of personality. I mean, he could talk on any subject in, in, in the government with um, uh, you know, including economics, with with a, a great deal of, of expertise. Ronald Reagan was not interested in immersing himself in that, but he was able to make management decisions and um, to focus on the things that he did care about in ways that were very effective. Not many people can do that successfully. So I, you know, I worry about him um, being in over his. Had. You know, uh, 
George W. Bush, who is a graduate of my, um, we're both proud graduates of Yale University, um, and, and Bush also had a degree from um, uh, Harvard Business School, you know, the, um, uh, the, the, uh, in the United States, not, not counting uh, business schools here in Europe, but in the United States, you know, regarded as the best or in the top two, the top two or three. He did, he was a, a good campaigner. Um, uh, and, you know, he won two close elections. He was a terrible manager, you know, so, and there were consequences of that. And um, uh, so, you know, I, I think that if, if um, Donald Trump ends up being the Republican candidate, which is, I, I still wouldn't say it's likely, that, um, but the odds makers in Las Vegas are, you know, getting more favorable on it. <laughs> Um, uh, if he ends up being the candidate, people are going to have to um, uh, ask themselves those questions, and and um, uh, it it will be a very interesting election. Yep. Thank you very much, Paul. Thank you, Universidad de Navarra. Thank you, Fundación Rafael del Pino, and thank you, you for being here, attending this uh, conversation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.